So happy International Women's Day, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the UCSF Women Physician Scientist Supergroup and the UCSF Committee on the Status of Women, I'd like to welcome you to today's session. And our land acknowledgement is as follows. And I will put up this post survey, um, just in case you have to leave early, uh, just maybe take a screenshot of that. And there's a uh, link. Um, we'd like, love to hear from you about our session afterwards. And we'll also post this after the session. All right. So, hi everyone. Um, we are here today with uh, a great group of of women scientists um, and representatives of, uh, of science at UCSF from across across the um, across the schools at UCSF, um, I am going to introduce all of our uh, illustrious panelists, um, and I'll start with Matilda Chan. She is a professor in the UCSF Department of Ophthalmology and Proctor Foundation. Her basic translational research program studies the molecular mechanisms underlying corneal diseases with a focus on corneal wound healing and fibrosis and Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy. It's so wonderful to have you here, Matilda. Katera Wilder is an assistant professor in the Department of Bioengineering and Therapeutic Sciences at UCSF and the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, uh, and she's a Chan Zuckerberg Biohub Sci San Francisco investigator. Um, her, the overall goal of her research group is to uncover mechanisms causing immune-related immune -related pathogenesis during respiratory illnesses and use this knowledge to engineer improved cell-based antiviral and cancer therapies. Welcome, Katera. Licha Soleri is a professor of craniofacial biology and anatomy at UCSF, director of the program in craniofacial biology, um, and her lab has a record of continued productivity in the fields of developmental biology, mouse and human genetics, transcriptional regulation of morphogen morphogenesis and birth defects. All of her grad students, postdoctoral fellows and, and instructors who've trained in our group have gone on to successful careers in biomedical research, in academic or biotechnology settings or in academic medicine. Hi, Licha, so happy Hello. to have you Thank with you. us. Thank you very much. Claire Cleland is an assistant professor of neurology at UCSF. She's a physician scientist and a recent co-founder of a company uh, advancing CRISPR therapy for neurodegenerative diseases. Her research lab at UCSF develops novel therapies for neurodegenerative diseases and centers on creating novel CRISPR gene therapies for genetic forms of dementia and ALS and aims to develop a first in class gene therapy uh, for central nervous system diseases. Thanks for being here, Claire. And Erica Hutchins is an assistant professor in the uh, of cell and tissue biology at UCSF. The Hutchins lab seeks to map how post-transcriptional regulation controls developmental pluripotency and cell fate decisions in vivo using vertebrate uh, a vertebrate neural crust uh, as a, a model. Erica was recently awarded an Early Career Investigator Award by the American Association for Anatomy. Great to have you here, Erica. And uh, last but not least, uh, Maya Kodis is an assistant professor of medicine at UCSF. She's a physician scientist and intensivist in the division of pulmonary critical care, allergy, and sleep. She started her lab in July of 2023. Her overarching goal is to uncover new molecular and cellular targets for the treatment of inflammatory airway diseases like COPD, asthma, and cystic fibrosis. Thanks for joining us, Maya. And I, uh, Carolyn Shungakoya, I'm an assistant professor of pathology and a physician scientist here at UCSF. Um, I started my lab in September of 2023. And the overall goals of my lab are to understand how RNA networks drive cell fates, cell functions, and plasticity in stem cell biology, and to apply an RNA-based lens as a pathologist to better understand the human liver in health and disease, and to build tools uh, for regenerative therapies. 
Um, and so with that, we are all across the board here with disciplines, experience, and academic ranks. Uh, but all of us are here today supporting the ECSF community and beyond um, in inspiring and supporting the next generation of women in science. And, and with that, um, I'll start with, with some questions that, that I am posing to the group. Um, and we do have a Q&A tab. So if you, if you do have questions, uh, feel free to put them in the tab. And we have, um, we have Christina here, um, which hopefully you can see Christina. Um, she is in the Department of Medicine. Uh, she is an illustrious uh, HHMI Hannah Gray Fellow here at UCSF and also in the Women Physician Scientist Group. Um, and she will be able to, to sort of collate these questions and, and get, them, get them across to the group. So thank you. Um, so to start off with, um, across UCSF, many of us are part of efforts that are focused on advancing both women and those underrepresented in science, medicine, and engineering uh, by opening doors, increasing retention, and building community. Um, and the theme for this year's International Women's Day is inspiring inclusion. And so that's part of this year's theme um, in, in our scientific communities. And so um, I'm wondering if anyone wants to highlight initiatives that you've worked with um, and that you want to share with the group. Uh, an initiative that I think is uh, amazing and wonderful has been this program initiated here at UCSF, which is called uh, PROPEL, and it is to advance and promote inclusion of uh, underserved uh, students from disadvantaged backgrounds who want to pursue a career in science, either uh, biological sciences and uh, PhD or medical sciences and uh, MDs, PhDs or MDs are favored. And uh, I've had the, the privilege to be part of this uh, initiative as a faculty mentor. And I've already hosted two postback students in my laboratory, mm -hmm. uh, the third one coming in June. And they are all fantastic individuals. And uh, the first one, uh, Peter has now uh, moved on and he has been accepted to be part of the graduate program in developmental biology at Stanford University. Oh, so great. he came from an amazingly disadvantaged background and uh, he has remained a hero in my mind because of how he was able to to really emerge from the background he was born and raised in and has, you know, wanting to be a developmental biologist. And now he's at Stanford, very happy there. And I think this is beautiful. The second uh, postback I'm hosting is a woman, Jaden, amazing young woman, also coming from a disadvantaged background and the first in her family to go to college. And she's a wonderful human being and a very good student. And the third one will come uh, in June, Ryan. And I'm just very happy to have participated to this initiative. And I think it is a wonderful way to bring people who would not have a chance to be, uh, you know, to be part of the science and medicine uh, enterprises. Thanks, Lisa. So that's the, the, the UCSF Propel program. Yes. Um, okay, great, great. Has anyone else been a part of that program on, on the panel? I've heard great things about it. Oh, yeah, great, great. Yeah, yeah I would really encourage anybody who is interested in having a uh, you know, young people in the lab who can be trained, especially those now who are also starting their lab as assistant professors. Uh, every year there is a call and uh, there is kind of what they call a matchmaking event where faculty of UCSF are uh, given an opportunity to meet with various of these students coming from underdeserved backgrounds. And there is really what's called a matchmaking. You spend like 10 minutes with various students and then you have to see if you with whom do you match, and then you have a follow up interview. And yeah, in my case, and I also think in Erica's case, since we divide lab space, okay, she <laughs> already a wonderful post back, and it's been a pleasure to see these young people grow and really, you know, become independent thinkers. And from where they come from, it's in my opinion like a miracle. So I think this is a wonderful initiative. And... That sounds great. 
That sounds great. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Piggyback on um, Leach's comments. Yes, I agree. Um, Huge fan of the Propel program, uh, as Leach said. Um, Actually, the first member of my lab, and she started the same day I did, um, was a post-bac scholar from the Propel program. And we're very excited that she is um, actually currently on one of her many graduate school interviews right now. So we're very excited. Um, Yeah, and uh, that's been a really valuable program. Um, And I actually also wanted to mention that um, I'm a member of the Women in Cell Biology Committee, uh, WICB, as part of the American Society for Cell Biology. Um, And this is a, you know, a committee within uh, my site, my particular scientific society that is, um, while it's called women, um, we're now being much more inclusive um, towards, you know, non-binary and um, allies. Uh, as well um, to that committee. And it's it's um, something that we have a major, um, you know, event at every annual meeting um, to try to, you know, bring together, um, you know, women and non-binary trainees and um, folks in the community and allies um, to really address, you know, issues that many of us still continue to face um, in science. And so I, you know, encourage uh, many of you, if you're not in cell biology, perhaps your own societies have um, something similar. And if they don't, I hope, you know, it gets started because uh, many societies still have um, some obstacles to overcome. So, yeah. I'll jump Thank in. You. I had, yeah. I, in my, in, I'm in ophthalmology and in the vision science field, we have a very similar program. So in ophthalmology, I've been part of two leadership development programs. One is a more, uh, as a is just called the American Academy of Ophthalmology um, Leadership Development Program, but then through a different, um, uh, through a vision research organization, they have one dedicated just to women. And so it's been interesting having participated in the two programs, how different they are. The woman-focused one, I feel has been great. I've been in the program now for about 10 years. And so it's been interesting because some of the, I started off as a mentee and I've seen other mentees through the years. And a lot of the mentees have now gone on to um, sort of leadership positions within that big conference and they're um, they're they're on the podium and they're promoting other women for awards and um, and it's because it's so women focused um, it's um, it's been nice to hear uh, similar to what Erica just said it's been nice to kind of hear um, issues that are specific to women and um, it's been really neat to just see over the years how the women have developed over the years and now so many of them have it was developed because when they looked at the leadership of that conference there were no women who were uh, in leadership positions and now at least half of them are, are filled by women so I think those kind of programs really do work And I was just going to highlight, I love the fact that UCSF has so many trainee run um, organizations here, and many of them are led by young women scientists. Um, Some that uh, that I'm a part of are B-STEM, Black and Excellence in STEM, um, as well as uh, the Immunotech um, organization. And one that I'm not a part of, but I'm hoping one of the other ladies on the panel is, is IG Equity. I know that is uh, focused specifically on women. And I know they, from the periphery, it seems like they're doing an amazing job um, of just gathering other women who are um, in uh, more immune related fields. Um, But again, I'm not directly involved with them, but I definitely wanted to make sure we got a chance to shout them out. And I'm just excited that we have so many trainees that are going into these leadership positions. It makes me excited about the future. Thanks, Katera. Yeah, I I wanted to second the uh, the IG equity and you know part of Amino X group. I'm not an an immunologist. Um, I'll say that officially, but I you know I do think that they're doing really great things. All right. Um, and and so I guess what's come up is a little bit, there are some issues that um, that come up when you have sort of women-focused groups um, around. Um, and just wondering, I guess, for each one of you, um, what issues m- most drive or inspire you? Or what do you think we still need to make the most progress on uh, moving forward? happy to throw in yeah (laughs) actually (laughs) so um a lot of my um peer mentors are um other young women pis that are you know we're all around the same approximate career stage 
And I find that um, a lot of our, um, you know, sort of complaints in the group text is often um, the invisible work and the work of service that is often disproportionately asked of women faculty and often less rewarded than other metrics of success, um, particularly in tenure and promotion cases. And so um, this is, I think, a still a problem. I think it's a very uh, pervasive problem, um, especially as, you know, ac activities, you know, in service in, you know, developing better equity and inclusion is worthwhile. And I think the greatest challenge right now is um, getting our you know, peers and tenure and promotion committees to treat it, treat it as such. Yeah, I totally agree on that. And I think being for sure here, the more senior person on this panel, mm -hmm. I can say that, uh, you know, for years and years, I've seen how women, me, me included, have been always called to serve and serve and then on everything. And then always feeling you have to do it because you're not so good at saying no. But then seeing that in the end, this is not really, uh, it doesn't bring you much and it is not highly recognized. So, you know, you can serve on three, four committees, but in the end, <laughs> that is not equally valued as you if you have a nature paper or uh, if you, you know, have three out of ones. So, of course, all the service detracts a lot of time and focus from your main activities of researcher and uh, or or medical doctor and i just want to encourage everybody me included who still now have a hard time to say no and that's why i do a lot of service to say no more often because i mean always saying yes will generate a lot of work of which you can also be very proud because honestly i am mm -hmm. very proud of what i've done but then it had not always it equals to getting recognition. So this is all I, I have to say as for sure the most senior member of this panel. And also uh, per perhaps potentially we should be recognizing this or making moves so that this kind of service is recognized yeah. more because it it does say something when um, when we are the ones doing some of the service, maybe we are attracting people that wouldn't necessarily be attracted to our areas. Um, if, you know, if we are the face of it, but on the other hand, we need that to be recognized. Yes. As, so as the value add. Would, yeah. The best would be to have it recognized yeah. uh, during my life career span until now, I haven't really seen that happen, but I hope mm -hmm. you guys who are younger and they you'll be there for the next 30 years that you'll be able to have it recognized because that will be very important. Also, because it is important to have good people who serve on committees, on, uh, you know, uh, thesis committee, qual exam committees, teaching, uh, you know, committees for, uh, you know, hiring new faculty. It is very important to have women and diverse people serving, but it should be recognized. And I have not mm -hmm. seen that really happen until now when you come up for tenure or, or any, you know, form of reward. So mm -hmm. it's be very important to find a way to have this recognized. I totally agree with you, Caroline. Yeah. And yeah. then uh, when we think about things like study sections and grant review panels, where that, that kind of thing is service too, but maybe it's a service that could be uh, in, you know, in service, I guess, <laughs> to, to getting more of us into, you know, getting more of us, the things that we need to continue in our careers as well. Definitely. And now again, I don't want to dominate the discussion, but there is a lot of work that needs to be done on that front. I've mm -hmm. served on panels for, you know, basic developmental biology. I've been on the roster for study section for many years. Now I serve on NIH council and I can tell you that there are not many women and those who are there, one takes minutes and the other one uh, brings refreshments in, and I don't like to see that. And uh, there's a lot of work to be done there, a lot of work to be done. And I can say that up to, when was it the last time? This was serving on a intramural NIH review, and there was a panel of uh, 10 people, and I was the only woman. 
and this very lustre Stanford professor, every time I would say a comment was calling me kiddo. So you can see my age, right? <laughs> like five years ago, and this man was calling me kiddo. So after the first session, I went to him and I said, I thought that was not appropriate. And he told me he thought it was an affectionate way to talk to me because he, when I was at Stanford, he knew me when I was a postdoc. Mm. So there's a lot of work to be done. A lot mm -hmm. of work. I think I think to, I, I chair uh, the Alzheimer's Association Clinician Scientist Fellowship grant, and I think it's really important to get uh, women and younger folks, underrepresented folks, in positions of leadership, so you can have your voice can have more of an impact. But when I serve on that committee and other NIH committees, I make sure to call out the roster if I see it, and to say, you know, to take a look at all the grants and see who we're awarding them to, and to make points. Um, and to promote folks who are equally um, qualified, you know, if there's a slate of equal qualification, then I take a look at the the status and try to promote people who are underrepresented um, in science. And I think we can all do some of that. And to piggyback on um, what was just said, I think we need to call out the bad behavior. I think it needs to be something that we're now actively doing. And since there's more women and in uh, on committees, we need to to start saying it um, in the public forum. Uh, this happens at, when I finish. I felt pretty protected in my training, actually, to, yeah. to some of this um, kind of patriarchal uh, way that people are treated. But I felt it very strongly as soon as I became an assistant professor. And I was, I'm surprised in this day and age, but the amount of, you know, there might be a woman in the room who is the total expert in something and other people are going to write a grant on her on her topic. I mean, that happened just this week. So I think we need to call that out, create strong alliances, vet your collaborators very closely. You don't have to, you know, we don't have to participate in activities or relationships that aren't serving us um, just to be polite. And we need to do that for other folks when we see it happen. Yeah. So I would like to ask this panel, actually, during that uh... A uh, horror story of this intramural study section where I was called kiddo. I had it uh, on the tip of my mouth uh, to say openly in front of the group that it should not me for four, five, six times address me as kiddo. But then wanting to avoid kind of a scene or I just told him privately. So do you people think I should have called him in front of the group and say, please don't call me that? I didn't do it. You know, I'm old fashioned. I thought, you know, this is rude. I, he's rude, but if I answer and put him on the spot in front of everybody, very lustrous professors, I would myself be rude. So I addressed him privately. But I don't know what people think here. I'd be happy to hear you younger women. What? what... <sighs> I don't that. think you would have been rude to to correct him. But I do think that like we women always walk this like tightrope in terms of how we're perceived by the rest of the audience. And so while I don't think it would have been rude and I think it would have been sort of appropriate for everybody to have learned, I do think that it could have like put you in a position where other people were judging you potentially unfairly for being difficult or whatever, any number of other things that I've been called. And you are difficult. Mm -hmm. You are a woman. You are difficult. And, you know, then he told me he thought it was a term of affection. And who knows, maybe it, that's what he meant. But I thought it was totally disrespectful because, you know, if you call somebody like that, it immediately puts them in a lower <laughs> category, right? When you have to to, to provide your input on grants that are intramural grants and intramural promotions. I mean, the kiddos shouldn't have, I mean, right? It's not at the same level of, of the adults. So if we want to, anyway, I was curious yeah. to hear what you were thinking about yeah. this. But and this again, is like oh, five okay. years ago, four years ago. So, yeah. I mean, you know, it's still going on. Still going, yeah. I was on a study section where there was a similar kind of, um, a woman was trying to make her point and there were men in the study section who were, were laughing and, and she was, she felt very belittled by the whole situation. She was very, um, she was being very professional, being very serious in her thoughts. Um, but there were a couple of men who were kind of laughing um, at her, just, it wasn't necessarily at her, but it was more the grant topic, but she was very supportive of the grant topic. And she thought it was a very important topic. Um, and she, 
for that study section, I was actually the chair. So then the uh, so the program officer ended up telling me what ha what happened. So the um, the female panelist who felt um, disrespected actually went up to the program officer during one of the breaks and and complained and said, "This is a professional setting." Um, this is, you know, this is someone's grant. And so, um, so it was good. The program officer brought it up after the break to the entire group and, and just reminded the group that this was a professional setting, that we were all sort of held to certain standards of behavior um, so that it, so the attention kind of came a little bit less from the, from the, from the person complaining and that it kind of came from kind of a more neutral um, person, I guess. Yeah, I think I think this is where it's really important to have allies in these situations. So it can't always be on the individual or individuals who are being um, in some way, you know, targeted or sort of, you know, treated less than. It has to be someone maybe in the in group who has the courage to acknowledge that what's happening and to stand up, you know, as a bystander. And so UCSF also, I've gone through this like sort of bystander training and like microaggression, like DEI champion training. And that was really tremendously useful for how to deal with these kinds of situations and what your responsibility is as a bystander when you're in an empowered situation. And so I think, you know, allies need to have training as well to recognize these situations and then, you know, address it in a way that is safe for the, the person who feels, um, you know, targeted in some way. And adding to that, uh, what you just said, Erica, I think um, I've had experiences as somebody who felt belittled at times thinking, oh, I'm just being sensitive. I should keep it to myself. And I think a lot of us have to fight that inclination and say, like, my feelings are valid. And if you feel the need to validate them, you can find one of those allies, um, seek their counsel and, you know, allow them to like say, yeah, like I think that we need to amplify like what you're saying, and I'm happy to take that on. Um, and uh, and I also firmly agree with you that like other people need to take up that mantle um, because it's sometimes awkward to be the person who is doing that. So I that is like a particular effort that I'm trying to do more of um, in and like trying to be that person for uh, fe people who feel belittled when that does happen. And I love this discussion because I feel like it hits on this sense of belonging, which I've been hearing more of and not just inclusion. Like I know we've been focused on DEI, but um, I feel like Again, what I've been hearing from other circles is that belonging is an even greater step that we could go to um, by having people who would be allies and where we won't have to speak up for ourselves. It would promote the sense that we actually belong in these spaces and um, would encourage, I feel like, even younger women, younger scientists to um, continue on in the track because I do feel like we still have this uh, issue with having women um, um, coming along a side of us in these more um, higher education or leadership positions. So I do think that there could be more efforts along uh, these lines. Not Again, not just for women, but then like we're saying allies as well. That is so important. And I highly encourage everyone to bring somebody with you. If you are on invited, even an NIH panel, say, I would love to serve. Are there going to be other women on the panel? Or if you go and you're the only one, I would love to do this again for you, but I would really like it if there was more more representation on this panel. Um, people do listen, you know, I would love to be the chair of this, but I, I'm really shocked that you don't have, you know, half of your committee isn't um, made up of other uh, uh, folks that I'd like to see on this panel. So bring people with you, even in your kind of junior stage of your career, you actually can say those things. And it does, once it's called out and seen, it's hard to hide from it and it does make an impact as uh, even on a small one. And over time that will change, you know, who are, who are making the decisions. I love that. I, I think that um, we're, we're, we're getting into our, my next question was how do we continue to inspire inclusion um, as a woman in science in 2024? But, you know, we're answering that right now. It's like, think about belonging, think about bringing people with you when you, when you, when you get there, be the person that, people can go to maybe behind the scenes to like have it affect like Matilda was saying like the whole committee um at the end of the day and I think I think that's great um what I um what I was thinking about in terms of in inclusion is it's you know 
I guess it means a certain, it means a certain thing at each level, right? And when, when you talk about inclusion on, you know, an NIH study section, you know, like that's like a really high level, right? That's like amongst faculty that were chosen, right? At that level. And then we think about in our lab spaces and, you know, that's like including people from all backgrounds. Um, but the reason we have the word inclusion is because maybe we know what exclusion looks like. And I think this is what Maya was saying a little bit about this, like, the sense that your opinion isn't valued or sort of even Lisa talked about this, like sort of a, a, a refusal to acknowledge expertise in a way. Um, um, there's all sorts of ways to be excluded um, and ways to be included and like at each level, <laughs> like there's just like layers on layers. And so the the term belonging, which Katera has brought into the, into the discussion, I think that that's like just a really great idea because that's the goal really um it's to inspire inclusion but it's to inspire belonging and to have like the the atmosphere be a place where where people can feel like they they can contribute um so great um i i think that um hitting at the 30 minute mark here um i think that we uh we kind of have to think about how we build intentionality into supporting um, networks of support. I think a lot of people have brought up, you know, uh, like Eric was talking about in her, in her um, conferences, you know, that there's like sort of networks that are being built, right? Um, and Matilda was talking about how she's seen it grow over the years and how the networks can actually change the, you know, the institution or like that, you know, that conference or that that committee that that that's there. Um, but at this day and age, how, how do you think that we can continue to build an intentionality in supporting networks for women in science, um, particularly for the academic faculty career? Because um, as we, we've talked about, there's so many layers to it, right? We're, we're all trying to like further our own goals, right? While bringing other people up um, and sort of like weighing, <laughs> weighing each of those edges. Um, so does anyone have any ideas? I think it I mean, I do, is I do like the bringing people with you. I, I, I thought what Claire was saying about like bringing at, at, sort of at, at every level, at every stage, um, doing that. That's that's a great that's a great way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sorry I love that as well. Yeah, no, no. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that it's important that we have a, you know, a discussion about and I think in this country in particular, um, family leave um, and acknowledging what it is to be a whole person and have work life balance. Um, is something I think benefits everybody, quite honestly, not just women. Um, but it's a real, you know, it's a reality, I think, in this country and in this society that um, often, uh, you know, women are the primary caregivers of children and family members. And, you know, there's a lot of um, time that comes with that. And, you know, that takes away from, you know, other activities such as research and teaching, et cetera. And I think it's really important that, you know, those that we consider that and, you know, perhaps make it a more, you know, inclusive environment, you know, academia needs to make this, you know, a reality that people are, you know, encouraged to have whole lives that are outside of, you know, just living and breathing academia, I think. And building on that, I also think even having more resource, resources for uh, access to fertility treatments would be great, especially as I feel like um, the amount of time that people put into their training, it pushes back their timeline for even producing families. Um, and mm -hmm. so I know that in uh, industry, especially in the tech industry, there's a lot of resources that companies provide women who may be having or starting families later in their life. But I think we need to have that conversation even in academia. Like, is there support from institutes? And I know there are, is some, but can we be doing more um, so that we can be uh, whole women or whole beings outside of just like what we do in our nine to five in our academic um, settings? I fully agree with that. And I also want to um, sort of like delve into what Erica was saying further with like maybe some specific examples. These are actually examples of things that I have like personally been told. Like I was, I have been advised that I can't really, that I shouldn't take a full maternity leave because I'll, I'll definitely need to start working uh, by like three weeks or so in, otherwise I'm going to be too far behind. 
I have also received the advice that I need to, uh, leading up to leave, uh, double up my efforts and write extra grants in preparation. So I need to be working more than 100% of my effort uh, leading up to that. Um, I've also been uh, advised that I may just have to accept that I'm going to have a loss of productivity during my leave and like, that's okay. And I've also been told it's fine because I can just delay my tenure clock, which means that like the, uh, the sort of <laughs> party lines, like um, uh, response to like this um, challenge is just to say like, you're going to be held back. You're going to be, you know, you're not going to be promoted as much. You're not going to be recognized as much. And um, I think exactly as Erica was saying, like promoting people as ability to be full humans is part of what makes a community wonderful um, and helps us be like people who are contributing not just to this, to a scientific endeavor, but to a society, which is like what this is. This is a community and a society. So um I think uh, like I fully agree with both what Erica and Katera have said about the need to support these other aspects of our lives and um, not to say like, it's just okay that women are gonna pay a penalty for something that like biologically no man can choose to do, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm so glad we're talking about the systems level issues. I remember going to these panels when I was earlier in my training and you know, 10, 15 years ago, they were all about how do you have a baby and balanced work life? And it's really nice to hear us say, that's not really the problem. The problem is the systemic issues that are barriers to people doing the jobs they love and advancing. And a lot of that is really centered on the cost of childcare. And I think if there's anyone on this webinar who could go solve <laughs> the issue and make childcare, you know, affordable and covered and not have schools let out at two in the afternoon, and acknowledge that women work in the workforce and it is not their job to take care of all the work that they do, which we acknowledge is even more, right, than some of our colleagues have to take care of at the workplace, plus all the work that we have to do at home. We have to pay for childcare and make childcare a viable, um, you know, a viable career path or elder care or all the care that we do. It needs to be compensated. I've even heard folks say that that should be compensated from the employer because it will be more valuable to have, you know, a diverse workforce and to have more productivity from people to have the resources to pay for childcare. I remember in residency, when I had my first baby, the nanny cost more than I made as a resident. So I couldn't have one, but I had to work from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. at night. So what was I supposed to do? Um, so we, we really have to tackle that issue. If there is a question, if it, it makes financial sense for the woman to leave the work and woman, I'm saying here because it's more often than not the woman, the statistics show that, but it makes financial sense for the partner, one partner, usually the woman to leave the workforce because it's more expensive to pay for childcare or equivalent. That is a problem. And that will continue to cause us to have dropout over years, which is not related to any intrinsic factor of any woman. So I think we have to, at the systems level, get our employers and our states and our governments to do that. So I encourage our future leader, leaders out there to solve the problem. All right, great, great. <laughs> Thanks for all of your, of your input there. Um, I, I think, uh, I guess we're leading up to, to the thought of uh, what sort of, we are encouraging those in our footsteps, right? Um, who also, who also um, want to have a rewarding career in science. Um, and what, what, ad what advice would you give? Um, and I guess we could start early. We could start, like what advice would you give to a graduate student um, considering a career in science or even beforehand, if anyone wants, if anyone has ideas there? Well, in my opinion, the best advice is always to tell people to pursue their real passion mm -hmm. and something they really have uh, enthusiasm for, because tough times always come during a PhD, during, you know, a postdoc, when things do not work, when you have frictions, maybe with your mentor, when experiments are not panning out. And if you have a passion for what you have chosen, and you really have a drive for that, 
you will overcome any type of obstacle. If you have done it just to fill in a box on your CV and say that you have a PhD, I think that that is not going to work out. And I've seen it over and over the years uh, in, in many students I've followed. So, you know, those who really make it and do well are those who love what they do. So that's, the I think, in my opinion, the best advice you can give is like, do pursue your real passion and then develop that. And of course, it helps to then have find good mentors, find good co-mentors, network, all of that all also comes and is important. But the, I think the first push is really doing something that you love. Yeah, that. I'd actually like to um, maybe play the counterpoint to that and say that I think that the mentorship and support structure thing is really, really critical. And part of this just comes from my own experience and my own feelings. Like I think I've been passionate about both medicine and science um, for a long time. But both are fields where there's just a really high propensity towards burnout. They're very, very challenging. Sometimes they're very isolating. There's a really high like de demand and like sometimes um, rewards or uh, successes are few and far between. So it's hard to keep going. And that is like really aggravated when you're in a situation where you have like the, the point that Katera brought up, like you lack a sense of belonging, right? If like your day to day is feeling like this, I don't, I don't actually fit there here. I don't feel good about this. And you're just like waiting for those wins in between. Like, I feel that like, it's actually hard for your passion to carry you through that. Even if you truly belong, at least, pr truly do love the thing and truly do um, uh, want to have that career carry you forward. And so I actually think that, um, finding your network and developing your team of mentors as early as possible. Um, and like continuing to build upon that team as you develop your career is really critical. And I think maybe at the earliest stages, maybe you just need like one or two people, right? You need somebody who's going to be like your cheerleader and somebody who's going to be your scientific advisor. And then as you get to like later stages, maybe then you need somebody who's going to, um, read work that you do or, um, you know, read, uh, like edit, um, you know, your papers. And then as you get older, then maybe you need somebody who, you know, is an example of like, uh, has a lab whose structure you'd like to emulate or has a lifestyle whose structure you'd like to emulate or, um, you know, like, and along the way, you maybe need also somebody who's just going to be able to like, listen to whatever it is you have to say, and is going to be in support of you, whether you say you want to quit, or you say you want to keep going that day. Um, but like, those are different things that I've needed over different stages of my life. And I think as I've gone, like on and on, I've needed more and more of those different facets. And I've understood, like, increasingly that no one person can ever be all of those things. So you really need to like, continually build it team of people who can fulfill all of these different needs that you have as a human, um, not just as a scientist, but as a human. Oh, that's for sure. You need mentors and you need the supporters and you need network. That's for sure. But if you don't have the passion, all of that doesn't account. I mean, you know, I've seen people go into these careers without really feeling that they want to do it. And then even if you have the best mentors, in my opinion, it will not work out in the at the very end. But this is my. You know. uh, I uh, I think I I think I see both both sides here. Um, and I I was I feel like I was vigorously agreeing with both of you. Um, because you do have to have that passion, it's almost like being like a like a shooting star. Like you have to like you have to have your own drive. You have to have your own your own creativity in science. You have your to have your own ideas, right? Like what makes you different from from you know what 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 do you bring to the table and and what is your passion? I think that's something that I really look for. Like what what is someone's passion? But like a shooting, like you get out there, you're 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 out there. You need to be able to be sustained in a way. And I feel like I've also seen that. Like you're out, you 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 burst. Um, you you know you're doing your thing, but then like you need to be edified by other people, colleagues, um, and then you do have those specific mentors for specific things type um, situation that like, you know, I think that is just um, different for everyone because we're all just so, such different people. Um, but I, I think I saw a little bit of something I agreed with with, with both of you. Um, does anyone else have anything? I, I think I was yeah, breaking it down. I think something. because, 
Oh, okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. I just want to add, because I had a conversation about this the other day um, about not having to ask for permission or not feeling like you have to ask for permission, especially for people who are younger scientists. I was speaking with someone who is more of at the undergrad stage, and she was saying how she had not gotten into research yet because she did not have permission from her, uh, like her academic advisor. And I was so shocked that she would even make the statement or she had that feeling. So just for people who are younger, or even if you're older and you still feel like you have to add, ask for permission, like I hope that we as women have um, agency over like our bodies and ourselves such that we will walk in boldness and take risks. Cause I feel like part of that is sometimes women and I don't think it's just a women thing, but people are afraid to take risks because of the failure. But I just wish that we as a society will, you know, stop that and just be bold mm -hmm. and just go, even if someone doesn't tell you to go. But what do you mean that she wasn't getting permission? I don't really understand. I guess she, her academic advisor just hadn't told her to get involved yet. I, I don't know. I just can tell you what she said. She just said she hadn't had, she did not have permission. And I was like, what do you mean? Just go email someone and that's to work in their lab. I can add an, an a personal anecdote to that story. Mm -hmm. I, as a graduate student, I was asked to come and speak to undergraduates um, in a biology program about what it is to go to graduate school. And one of the um, female undergraduates asked me um, if my parents were okay with the fact that I went to graduate school. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, well, were they supportive? I'm like, I didn't, like, it didn't occur to me to ask, <laughs> like, like, what their opinion was on it um and so that was kind of took me very off guard and I was like oh people like people solicit and I think actually where a lot of um you know young trainees and women especially I think where they feel this uncertainty and uh, like fear to be bold is you know rooted in um you know imposter syndrome and the fact that you know I speak with a lot of trainees um female trainees that struggle um continually with imposter syndrome and it's something that I think is, um, you know, it's not inherent. I don't think we naturally feel insecure. I think we're made to feel insecure. And so I hope that, um, you know, young female trainees and just young trainees in general, um, you know, are able to find, you know, the courage to have, um, you know, some, some confidence um, and that you're able to find supportive mentors that help you build that confidence. Um, and at, don't be afraid to actually ask, um, for sponsorship for things. Um, and actually the, um, Carolyn mentioned, I received an early career investigator award and that was, I asked for a nomination. Um, and so I think don't be afraid to put yourself forward. Um, you know, imposter, imposter syndrome affects a lot of us still, um, even as, you know, faculty. Um, but, you know, it's, that was, that is what I think is the biggest sort of hurdle maybe to success. And I think that has to do with, um, you know, maybe not feeling belonging, right? Feeling included in um, the sense of belonging. And so I think if, you know, trainees are able to overcome this, um, this feeling of not belonging and this, oh, maybe I can't do it. Maybe I shouldn't be here. Um, I think that will empower them to actually take the risks and ask for things that they will find hopefully passionate, like Lichu was talking about. Actually, that was a very that was very interesting what you said. Um, at one of the organizations, one one of the scientific organizations I'm in, um, uh, there was a woman I who gave a talk, and she was on the awards con committee for this um, organization. And she, she what she learned right away was women and men ask other men to nominate them for the big awards like it's all men who are getting these awards and she said she realized that a lot of the time it's men want the awards so they find someone to promote them and to sponsor them for the awards um, so she encouraged the women to help each other sponsor each other and I, I do feel that um, you know there are so many ways we can help each other as women we can um, nominate other women for awards, nominate other women for grant for in our department, we have a grand rounds uh, lecture series. So I always try to, I always try to um, have at least 50%, if not more of my nominees be be women. Um, 
um, committees that I've been on, or uh, you know, I try to promote other other women, senior women, junior women. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, and it's fun. Then you make friends over the years. You build your your network. Um, it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I second that. Get in a voting block with your friends and other colleagues <laughs> in your field. So we have started doing this whenever a award comes up. We have an, a national kind of group and we say, who are we going to, what, you know, who are we going to put forward for this one? It doesn't mean they're going to get it, but we have started to collectively do that. Not just even one person nominating another person, like let's all second this nomination. So get your groups together for whatever stage you're at. And I highly recommend you do that. And for other trainees, I think something to say to the, especially the MD, PhD and physician scientist track folks, it's a very long road, as you know, because you're probably in it. And there's a lot of ups and downs, like Maya was alluding to as well. There's a lot of challenges. Um, and that path is very prescribed. You know, you have to do all of this for a decade or more. But in the end, it is totally worth it. There are really no rules. You can do, we are the luckiest people. We can get funding to study whatever idea we think is important. We have this amazing physician training to really hone us into the most critical aspects of healthcare and our society and patience. And it is a totally rewarding perspective, but no uh, job and career, but nobody is going to tell you you're ready or go do this. You just have to keep going and you'll know when you find your passion, because it'll be the thing where people will keep telling you no, and you will not listen. I love it. Yeah. Oh, this is great. Um, so I, I actually, I, what I, what I really um, like about this is that um, Katera started off with saying, you know, be bold, like, yeah, you do have to ask people, like, what, what are your thoughts here? Because if, the, if someone starts with, you know, I don't have permission, that's like one level <laughs> of not being bold versus, right, like taking risks. But, you know, in, in science, in every area of science, right, the people that take the risks with the big ideas are rewarded. And if you sort of have an inherent block to doing that, it's, it's going to be a lot harder, right? Um, but that's something that we can help to support by sort of supporting each other in like networks um, and and sort of uplifting there. And I think, and Erica brought up imposter syndrome as well. well. You know, I think that there is an element to this sometimes that I think about. Um, I, my, my, my dad is a scientist, my mom is a nurse. Uh, neither of them were, were, you know, was a, like someone in academia. So like, you know, there are frontiers, I think that everyone kind of has that's like, you know, like I, I didn't have anyone in my family that was doing exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and so there's, you know, there's first generation um, physicians, there's first generation scientists, there's first generation physicians. So like there's, there are sort of like these lines that I think that everyone, you, they're kind of unseen. You don't know who has what, you know, quote unquote advantage or not, but like this experience advantage um, is something that people don't really realize. And and by talking and by getting support, you this is the way that you seek out those that kind of knowledge base. Um, and I think for you know someone that's like you know just on faculty and just starting a career and just starting a lab, um, it's it's something that you know you have to realize what you have and what you don't have and the tools that you need um, and go seek those out. So I really love the idea of like having all these different mentors for different things. Um, but I think that that's something that's it's kind of an unseen thing. And you don't know who who started off, you know, with certain advantages or not. And so I just wanted to bring that up because I think a lot of people listening out there might not have um, role models, you know, in their family or, you know, close by that that had this kind of experience. But, you know, like Katera is saying, it's like, you can email them, you know, and, that, and, and, you know, th this world is so small now that, that, you know, you email uh, someone in a position that you want to be in potentially in the future and ask them the questions um, and, and learn that way. So I, I think I wanted to encourage that uh, for our audience. Um, and C Christina, are there any questions from the audience? We've had, yeah, quiet Q and A for you. Okay. The right, discussion's great. been so rich. <laughs> People are listening in. <laughs> yeah. So we have we have four minutes left. If there's any anything that anyone else wants to say, sort of in closing, I'll try not to rattle on. 
I think um, just to kind of like continue to piggyback on this like thing mm -hmm. about belonging, uh, about this thing, this feelings of being an imposter and some of what you were saying, Carolyn, um, I think one thing that has become clear to me and that came up for me when Erica was talking is like, we still suffer from these feelings of being an imposter, even when you're at these much more senior levels, like that comes from people questioning you over and over and over exactly as like Lucia was saying, right? Like it happens even to her. Um, and there is a small part of you, like there may be a large part of you that is just like screaming, like this is so infuriating. And there's a small part of you that says, gosh, do I not belong here? Like, do I not deserve this? And that is an experience that I've had like over and over and over and over. And that experience has not gone away, even though I've like climbed ranks. And I think something that people should remember as they have climbed each successive, like, you know, met each goal and like climbed to the next stage is that like, you are good at this. You do belong here. You did that other thing and you did the thing before that and you did the thing before that. All of those steps that it took to get you where you are and you deserve like to take up space and you deserve to be bold in this situation that you're in because you're not small. Like you are progressively like bigger and more deserving at each stage. Um, and that's something that I like really see in like my, you know, peer group, like in, you know, when we get to uh, get together as like part of WPSS, for example, that's been the great source of inspiration for me to see other women who are at a similar stage of career, early stage, and to see, you know, like how impressive they are. And then to kind of look around and say, wait, these are my peers, like I'm in this group. Um, and so I encourage everybody to kind of like look at themselves and like recognize that they do belong and that they are accomplished. I have to, I, WPSS has been so great. Um, it's such a, such a nice group. Um, thank you, Carolyn, for helping us to, to set that up. Thank you. I, um, I think that part of the, part of, part of in founding that is, was because I was at a stage where I was reaching out for support and, and I found a lot of people, um, that were supportive and I wanted to kind of create the, the vision for the future, right? Like, I think that everyone kind of goes and experiences things, but I, I kind of wanted to be like, well, this is not the way I want it right now. So <laughs> I'm going to maybe try to like build the picture frame for, for what I want in the future. And I, and all of you are part of, of helping that to happen. And, and I think that even with this fan panel, I hope that in the future, you know, WPSS is for women physician scientists, but we have, we have women in life sciences. We have all these groups on campus. And plus we have all these other phenomenal women scientists around I just feel like there there have to be ways that we can bridge and talk to each other and sort of you know not have to be in a certain field to join you know to, to talk to each other um so I'm glad to know all of you as well um and it is four o'clock um and this has just been such a great discussion thanks thanks for joining us thank you for organizing thank you, thank you. Thank you very much nice to and get for you all